and here we are. Mm -hmm. Hello again, everybody. So here we are again. So we're okay in live in 10. Are we live already? Yes, yes, we, are. yes we are. So hello, good um good uh, evening again, everybody. And there is John Ray saying we are live and uh, here we are again. And good um Good evening again to everybody. This is Kronika Militar, and uh, we hear background. Uh, uh, so uh, here we are in Kronika Militar. This is our fourth, right? Our fourth um, uh, uh, episode or podcast, and this time we are re we are doing the. We are doing the second installment on the Korean War. So together with me right now are um, Phil Elefante, uh, a journalist, Reno Francisco, journalist editor, uh, Reno Francisco, who is a military historian. Of course, we have John Ray, who is in the background right now. And then we have Mark Condeno, who is uh, our special guest. More on Mark Condeno. Um, in a few um, minutes, but um, for um, starters, let's see first uh, who our, uh, there we go. Hello, good evening, sir. So once again, we already have somebody who's greeting us. Uh, Gian Sedino is saying good evening, sir. Yes, uh, good evening. Good evening, Gian. Gian. I hope that you have a great evening right now, and we hope you'll be not just entertained, but, um, but um, you will learn a lot from uh, our discussion today on the um, Korean War and more the, on the Philippine Expeditionary War in Korea, uh, which, uh, of which uh, we will be discussing a certain contribution of the Philippines that is not uh, known by many uh, Filipinos because when we say PEF talk, we think automatically of of the infantry units that were sent there. But here we have Mark Condeno, and he's going to discuss with us uh, what, uh, he's going to discuss what specific unit was that that participated in the Philippine, uh, in the Philippine contingent in the Korean War. And uh, just for a background, Mark Condeno here is a, uh, is the curator of the uh, Korean, uh, uh, what, what is the, what is the, uh, formal name of your um, museum, ja uh, Mark? Uh, it's the Peftok Korean War Memorial Hall. It's a Peftok. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, we'll um, we'll be having your presentation um, um, after this. Um, after this, uh, we will first have a brief overview of the Korean War, just for the, our. Uh, 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 listeners and viewers right now. So um, last time we talked about the Korean War uh, and that was some months ago when it was the anniversary of the um, Korean War itself, the, the, the outbreak of the Korean War. Now we're talking about the Korean War again. And the question is why now? What is so significant about the month of September when it comes to the Korean War and the uh, Philippines and um, and uh, of course, this month. Um, any of you guys would want to um, tell us or tell the viewers what is so significant about it? Why are we talking about it again? Yeah. Okay. Um, Rina. Okay. okay. Uh, first of all, uh, September marked one of the first uh, turning points in the uh, Korean War. That turning point being uh, the Incheon landing. Uh, if you remember, the first uh, few months of the war, from January, uh, June uh, 1950 up to uh, early September, was a time wherein the North Korean uh, uh, had the initiative. So the United Nations forces were on the defensive, uh, largely. Although by September also, they have stabilized their uh, Toho in uh, Busan. No? Uh, yeah, uh, Busan, then Busan. No? Now, September 15, uh, uh, MacArthur launched an amphibious uh, assault in uh, at Incheon, which is just a few uh, ma just just a few miles from Seoul. No? Uh, the, capital. the result of that amphibious landing was it was a success, and uh, it led to the cutting off 
of the North Korean uh, People's Army. Suddenly, the war uh, turned, uh, uh, radically turned. The fortunes of the war radically uh, turned. And within a few weeks, the North Korean army was largely uh, destroyed. Uh, in that sense, also, uh, that, uh, uh, that operation, while outstandingly successful, also generated another future turning point, which is the Chinese uh, intervention. Although there were some uh, sources that said that the Chinese really planned to intervene uh, even before the initial landing. But that was the one of the significant... Uh, uh, one of the significant uh, events uh, in the Korean War, and it happened in uh, September. Yeah, Phil, would you like to add to that? Yeah, if I remember correctly, uh, that was Operation Chromite. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, that was uh, meant to cut off the road network that passed through Seoul that was uh, supplying the North Korean forces that was besieging the Pusan perimeter. When did uh, when did our contingent um, land in Korea? Uh, that would be September 19. We, we we departed around September 15. So it marks the 70th anniversary today. There you go. So so exactly. So we are in that period. And in fact, a few um, days ago. There was a ceremony in Korea itself, South Korea, to be exact. Okay? Because if you say Korea, maya maya, nandun yung si dear leader, di ba? It's the other Korea, no? the, the South Korean one. No? Uh, um, and um, um, in that, uh, um, would you would you like? Uh, would, were, did the Korean War Museum here participate in any such commemoration uh, commemorative activities, uh, Mark? Uh, yes, we uh, actually it's supposed to be September seven, uh, yes. which was the day uh, Republic Act five seventy was enacted, which justifies our deployment to Korea. Uh, just last week, I think September nine, a week ago, uh, a commemoration was held at the Libingan ng mga bayani at the Korean pylon. So that marks the seventieth deployment of the Philippine uh, contingent, the tenth BCT. And what about in? in um the one in Korea, the one that was held in Korea that was actually commemorating our landing there, which uh, was attended by the UN. Did, did, uh, did uh, yes, have... the one in, in Goyang. In Goyang. Yes. Uh, in Goyang, uh, the commemoration was at the beginning of the Korean island. So, yes. it's the 17th of the Philippine the UN, the UN, so there. So anyway, so I just had that feedback, um, make that feedback pass. So anyway, uh, going back to so so we just had our 70th anniversary uh, commemorations of that particular um, uh, event of us landing in uh, South Korea. Now, uh, Mark, uh, would, could you give us a brief overview of our of of, of uh, our participation at that point at that point in time of the Korean War, the 1950 to 1950? So basically, uh, I'll do a sort of a recap. Uh, June 25, 1950, the invasion uh, by the North Korean People's Army. And then uh, the uh, request of the UN to militarily support the uh, embattled uh, ROK Republic. So around July, um, we, we deployed the famous 16 Sherman tanks and uh, one M18 Hellcat tank destroyer. So that was shipped directly to Pusan by the US Navy. And uh, I think it was all, all of our tanks that were, were sent were uh, destroyed in Vietnam. Then by September 15, the uh, first uh, BCT contingent so, uh, arrived in Pusan on September 19. Yeah. 
So around July, um, we redeployed the Vino Six Stars and uh, one Canadian Hellcat Hat Destroyer. So that was shipped directly to Busan by the US Navy. And uh, I think it was all, all of our attacks that were, were sent for uh, US Vino. Thank you. Thank you. Then by September 15th, we received it. Okay. Um. Now, anyway, so, so, uh, uh, what are the what are the um, initial taskings of the Pef talk in uh, uh, as it uh, arrived in Korea? So, uh, initially, uh, upon landing, uh, they were issued some of the uh, UN, of course, American weapons, and then just within a week, they were sent to Miryang for some training. And then after that, they they have their first action with the North Korean, yeah, North Koreans uh, in Myodong. So this is the Battle of Myodong Singye, which uh, I believe you know, uh, Major Yang was one of the uh, Major Max Yang was one of the uh, heroes of that particular battle. So so I understand, Mark, that you have a presentation for us, right? Uh, which yeah. talks about um, because we did discuss about the uh, Philippine participation in the Korean War in the previous uh, uh, episode. So right now uh, we are we are going in depth now, and that's why we got you aboard so that you could talk about that particular um, issue, uh, that particular aspect of the Korean War that not many are aware of, and that is I think it flashed right in the screen, which was the uh, participation of uh, what service. Uh, the, that's the participation of the Philippine Navy, so for escort operations and uh, combat service support. Okay, uh, so we'll be turning over the uh, we'll be turning over the uh, discussion to you now, so that you can provide your uh, presentation. Sure. Okay. Uh, so uh, the escort operations began on September 19. That was when the uh, tenth BCT deployed. So here is the. Uh, Backgrounder, here is the uh, contents of what I will uh, present. So, yeah, we could have it. Yes. So, we'll begin with the Philippine Naval Patrol. Actually, it's already the Philippine Navy. It's, it was just a yeah. few months when uh, it, it trans uh, transitioned to the Philippine Navy. Mm -hmm. So, uh, es uh, escort mission, and then a naval officer in an army battalion, combat service support. So, exercise in wartime. I think this was particularly uh, done with the 14th Battalion Combat Team when the uh, LSTs of the Philippine Navy conducted exercise with the Allied Navies, mostly on anti air, anti surface, and anti submarine. This and was. Lastly, yes, yes. Yes, yes, continue, continue. Uh, Okay, and of course, lastly, the Philippine Navy at the United Nations Command Philippine Liaison Group in Tokyo, Japan. So this is the uh, overall participation of the uh, naval service during that particular war. Yeah, could you give us details of that particular? Could you go? Hey, could we could start on the uh, slides, I think. Yes, yes, yes. There you go. Okay, so so at that time the uh, navy was headed by uh, or what we call the FOIC, flag officer in command, uh, Commodore Jose B. Francisco. So the patrol force was uh, headed by then Lieutenant Commander Heracleo Alano, uh, World War II veterans. Yes. So these were of uh, these were like offshore patrol, uh, offshore patrol. Uh, Al Alano is an offshore patrol uh, uh, personality, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, he was with the uh, original OSP. Yes, the precursor of the navy, right? The of the uh, directly under army command during the 1930s, and um, precursor of the navy um, that developed into the Philippine uh, offshore patrol. Uh, uh, yes, continue, Mark. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, yeah, that's correct. Uh, so they began from the OSP, the offshore patrol, and then by 1945, it was reinstituted as the, of course, it's still the OSP, and then. Around 47, 1949, it was the Philippine Naval Patrol, and by yes. 1950, it became the Philippine Navy. So, no, may na una na palang PNP, no? Yes, yes, may na una <laughs> PNP. <laughs> Pero ito PNP na to hindi may ilik sa manyanita, no? Yeah, naman, no? 
<laughs> so, so guys, go on. Moving forward, before we. By the way, uh, we are we are on ano tayo dito. We are but ano to? Ano ba tayo? Category natin history bloggers ba tayo? Ano ba tayo? At ay <laughs> so anyway, continue. Yes, Mark. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, that interrupted. Okay, all right, continue. Uh, okay. Could they have the uh, slides uh, right now? Ah, there was a flagship. Okay. Okay. There's... So basically, the, the the Philippine Navy was was what? Yeah, we 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 do have. That's already our one, two, three. I think that's the fourth flagship that we have. The Apple. So it's a former minesweeper of the U.S. Navy, the former USS Quest. So it became one of our it, uh, actually a longer a long serving flagship. It's it's a, well, it's if you don't uh, mind let us let us let's go can we, if you hope you don't mind I want to go geek on this particular issue okay because it's like seldom do I do I see somebody who would uh, be knowledgeable about this particular thing so this is a US uh, minesweeper of World War II if I'm correct right yes yes that's correct and and, and it um, it uh, saw and it saw service what was its prior um, and uh, what was its prior personality prior to it being a Philippine Navy ship? Where was it uh, deployed? Pacific or Euro? Uh, I believe it was deployed here, here in the Pacific. So Pacific. it's an admirable class mine sweeper. And basically, ah, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a, a sort of a sister of the PCEs. Ah, so, so don't we still have uh, admirable still um, operating now? Or Wolana? Wolana legacy ship is uh, admirable. I think wala na. I think we we only have two way back. This one and another admirable class, and uh, then the rest are mostly PCEs. Okay, so just for the audience, when we say legacy, we're talking about really ancient stuff or the old, old equipment. So when we say legacy equipment, we're talking about old equipment of the. But during this time in 1950, that ship was actually considered new, because it would be barely like I would assume that was uh, manufactured in uh, that was uh, constructed in 1943. Thereabouts, um, 1943. Thereabouts, uh, which would be 43, 44. So that ship was barely, was barely seven years old when it was turned over to the Philippine uh, uh, Navy. Okay, uh, Philippine uh, Naval Patrol. So, yes, continue, Mark. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, basically, most of the ships turned over to us were built around 42, 43. So six, seven years old, or some, some are even three years old when they were turned yeah. over in 48. Mm -hmm. So fairly new, not not um, not totally battered, but a fair, yes. very fairly new. And then we, uh, the capabilities were there. The capabilities, especially the anti-submarine, the the anti-submarine, which I will discuss later on. Okay. Yes. 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 So, oh, another okay. one. Yeah. So that's one of the patrol cap uh, patrol cap escorts E twenty eight. So way way back. So just to share. We we don't have any um, what do you call this native uh, name for our ships, mm. so we we just use the number. So E means uh, escort, escort, escort number twenty eight. Yes. Mm. So but by, by around the fifty, I think nineteen fifty three, when Admiral Francisco decided that all ships have, should should have a Filipino name, but uh, from around forty eight down to fifty fifty two. Uh, all has just the numbers, or we, we just retain the names of the American uh, vessels. I, I remember that we used to call it RPS, right? And uh, uh, up until the 1970s, if I'm correct. Uh, I think we shifted, the before, before 80s, we 80s. Oh, yeah, 80s. Before we shifted to the BRP, right? Yeah. Uh, BRP. But we used to we could call it RPS. I, I I'm that old. <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, basically we, we we started I think eighty one, eighty one. So yes, from yes, eighty three yes. to eighty one. I actually was, remember. Uh, I remember the transition actually, which is really <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> anyway, so so going back so that you have the RPS Cebu, um, and uh, it was what formally again previously it was what. Uh, uh, it it uh, it's a patrol craft escort. So okay, basically, so all, yeah. So also anti submarine. Um, uh, yes, uh, all, all of the five ships that were turned over to us were uh, ASW capable at that time. So, so, so in a way, in a way, okay, just again, we're meandering a bit, of course, because we're talking about the Korean War here. But just for the sake of, we have this opportunity to talk about early Philippine Navy ships of the post-war period, okay, 
of the early post-war period. And and for me, it appears that that uh, we that uh, we were somewhat, although we predated the Japanese in terms of the Japanese maritime self-defense forces. Uh, yeah. We, we, we were on that same pattern also as becoming um, a navy of anti-submarine capabilities. So that, I think that was the pattern that the Americans were doing in the region, which was to establish naval capabilities of its allies along a anti-submarine capability or ASW. So that's why if you look at the Japanese maritime self-defense forces that evolved in the 1950s onward, it had a very strong ASW... Uh, capability um, and we were there but somewhere along the line uh, along the way we just sort of um, you know deviated and let's not get into that because we're okay, going back to the Korean War again continue yes uh, sorry again yes Mark okay. so uh, I'll just wait for the slides to go so we, we have five of those yeah oh there yeah. wow yeah is any of them f because they look so familiar are they still existing like up to now uh, I think two or uh PS31 is still uh, still active. PS31, Pangasinan, Pangasinan. Because this thing, the three the three portholes on the uh, I mean, that so that, that, that looks so familiar. Anyway, yes, continue. Yes. Okay. So yeah, later. Late, yeah. Uh, mm. So that's that's the escort for the uh, presidential ship. So it was lost around uh, 77, 78, I think. Oh, ground what, what? police. By by what what happened to it? Uh, I think it was a typhoon mm. and uh, typhoon. ran aground around the Wallace Air Station. Ah, so this is but um like what was the one that Kalanchaba, the one that also ran aground or yes. uh, that, that capsized, right? So this one is uh, yes. So we we seem yeah. to have we seem to have named our ships after provinces. Or, yes, uh, there are uh, what do you call the categories for the capital ships. We name it for the three large provinces, and then okay. for the more other or the other combatants after the provinces for the auxiliaries and the oilers for the uh, what do you call this the native uh, tribes. So that mm -hmm. that sort of uh, nomenclature for, for the uh, navy. Okay. So thank you. So the next is this Pangasinan. What was Pangasinan in then at that time? Yeah, still, uh, she, uh, she performs the same function with the patrol okay. craft escorts. So anti-sub also. Uh, basically, the Americans uh, provided us this um, ASW-capable PCEs and uh, 16 submarine chasers. So that okay. would be on the third part of the presentation. Did this were like hedgehog, uh, they, had, they had hedgehogs, depth charges, the, the entire shebang, right? They, they, I would assume. The, correct, correct. Uh, all the entire ASW uh, yeah. suit. Okay. Yes, continue, please. Thank you. Uh, okay, so, uh, well, up, up apart from, uh, okay, so that's one. We, we only have five. During 1950, we only have five of the uh, patrol craft escorts. Okay. These were our capital ships. Yeah. Yes, the, the uh, capital ships of the uh, patrol force. Okay. Okay. Okay, that's it. So, submarine chasers. We, we have 14 of the 110 uh, type and nine of the uh, 173. So, this is much bigger. The 173 uh, sub chaser type. Yes, uh, yes. Basically, the Americans wanted us to become the uh, an ASW, uh, yes. anti submarine warfare, <laughs> let's say, uh, masters of ASW yes, here in yes. Southeast Asia at that time, and mine warfare. So, those are the two functions that uh, the Americans want us to handle, especially during the Cold War. So, Joe, just to, just to, okay, give, um, uh, just to, emphasize a point because usually we have a lot of of um uh propaganda against uh, the alliance system uh, up, up to now right and the, one of the uh, myths that are being said was that the the um, americans uh were were giving uh were just uh, what you call it uh, giving us useless weapons we, we were just given we were just being relegated to internal security but as you can see here there was really a program to make to to strengthen our external capabilities okay and uh, and uh, in fact had it not been for certain internal developments in our country our navy might have just been like the japanese maritime self-defense forces had 
things turned out differently for us in terms of our internal security situation. So, okay, um, I just wanted to say that. Oh, before before we before we before I run, I would like to just again greet some of those who are um, greeting us again. Okay? Some of some of our uh, viewers now. We have here uh, Randy Jules Mamaril. Who say good evening, Reindeer. So I keep on saying Reindeer whenever I see him, Reindeer. <laughs> okay, then uh, Randy, Randy. I will have to ask him why his name Randy. And then um, Gian again says that he still has to. Uh, read his books for Tal Mr. Talento, but he wants to have a good break and to refresh himself with a little history. Well, there's not going to be a little history here. It's going to be a lot of history for you. And at the same time, Sir Talento, once he finds out that you're not uh, studying, he will give you, he will uh, most likely make life difficult for you. So good luck on your studies with Sir Talento because he's a very, uh, one of my um, uh, great friends and um, he's a really a great uh, professor and we have of course Desiree and Kuwa Benipayo okay who was our hello my oh, friends hello Desiree hello, hi Desiree hello. hi Desiree hello there yes I'm fanboying there you go so anyway so going back again to our topic um yes Mark uh, continue with your uh, if you don't mind so there uh, okay so we could proceed um yes all right that's it so combat service support so the combat service support for the uh theft talk began on uh, i think 1950 when uh, when the uh <coughs> returned back so that was october 1951 okay. so that was the beginning of the philippine navy's combat service support during the korean war and ended at with the 14th battalion combat team around 1954 because the second battalion the last theft talk battalion that we sent was uh brought in and brought out by the united states navy from korea can can this be um can this be like zoomed in the, the ships possible possible yeah. ba mag zoom in sa no hindi kaya that, that that chart this one this one no the the, the chart the chart the chart upper left corner upper left corner upper left corner there if we can there you go so those are the pef talk uh the ships that uh, so the first one was Sylvester and Antolak. Antolak. but but it's a, actually a U.S. Uh, ship. It's not uh, yeah. a yeah. yeah. It's not a Philippine ship. Sounds just like a Philippine name, but not. Uh, then coming back to the Philippines, you had uh, Philippine ships already. Yes. So, but but you mm -hmm. will see that I have uh, blackened the Philippine mm -hmm. ships. Uh, basically, mm -hmm. during those times. So you would see LST-75. We, we haven't named them yet. So we just okay. call them LST-843, LST-842. Mm -hmm. The same American numbers when we received them. Oh, so, really? Yeah. yeah. Uh, we, we didn't use our, uh, any Filipino names. Uh, only the uh, flagship and some of the uh, lighthouse standards that we have, we also retain the uh, American names. What, 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 sir, what, what amazes me is the fact that these ships were the... Um, for example, U.S. NSS uh, Sergeant Antolo, is it uh, what type of ship is it? Is it an L is it a five one one type also or different? Or a, uh, like it's a, a different one. It's a different. It's not a five one one types. It's not one mm. they. It's a, so, yes, yes. but yes. Yeah. It's yes. A, it's a, uh, uh, not a five one one type, but rather a cargo cargo vessel, transport cargo mm. vessel. A cargo vessel. So it's more of the. More on the uh, class of the uh, Kaiser ships. Is it one of the uh, ships like a Liberty this ship? One, the, 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 yeah, the Antolak is this one. The, ah, there you uh, go. The, yeah. it's a, is it a Liberty ship? It looks like a Liberty sort ship. Sort of a Liberty ship. Sort, uh, basically, a type of Liberty ship. A type of Liberty ship. Okay, so, and then, um, then LSTs were the ones. And then I can imagine how long did their voyage take? Uh, Especially the five four, days. four days. Oh, four days. So they were fast then, right? Except if you encounter some, uh, of course, technical yeah. problems. Because I remember, right, that the five one ones um, by the nineteen nineties or two thousands, uh, like they were like crawling practically on the seas already by that time. I remember a a a, a <coughs> travel from from to the mouth of Korea, to the mouth of the bay from from Philippine Navy headquarters to the mouth of the bay would take almost the entire night because it would be very slow, something to that effect. These were the old legacy ships we had, the old LSTs. 
Yeah, yes. but okay, going okay. So we have here the shores of Busan escort and combat service support. Okay. Yeah, basically that uh, on the uh, right side is the Antalak, and then the yeah. smaller ship that's RPS Capis. So this is an actual photograph Ooh. of the uh, yes. escort Negron. So Capis mm -hmm. was escorting Capis and uh, Negros Occidental, I think Oriental was escorting the Antalak up to the South mm -hmm. China Sea. So these uh, sub chasers came from their base in Corredor. So mm -hmm. the submarine chaser base of the Navy was in Corredor way back. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. And Corredor was already a Philippine uh, naval patrol base. Yes, yes, it was at that time already a Philippine naval patrol base. Because because uh, at that time, um, Sangli would still be under the Americans, right? Sangli would yes, still yes. be uh, under the Americans and. Uh, there was nothing man in um, in uh, Bataan. I don't think there was any naval installation in Bataan uh, that was of any significance to uh, the uh, at the tip of uh, Maribeles or what. Okay, so uh, what was there? Uh, I think, but uh, of course, during the fifties, we don't have any base way back in Bataan. No. Uh, yes, we actually during World War Two, we do have uh, in yes, Sisi yes, yes. In yes, yeah, that that was the. The um, MTB, uh, the, what do you call them? The motor torpedo boats, right? Yes, the MTB and the OSB base. So yes, the OSB yeah. base was there. I'll see Simon. Okay. Uh, yes. Um. Continue. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Mark. There you go. Okay. Yeah. There. Okay. So that's the uh, a naval officer in an army battalion. So that's Lieutenant Commander Emilio Liwanyan. Uh, he was specifically requested by the Philippine Army to join mm. the uh, 10th BCT. So a lot would ask why. So an yes, why not? Officer yes, joined, why? Why, why joining an army battalion? So he, he recently finished a gunnery course here in Fort McInley, present day Fort Magnipasio. Oh, and uh, so that particular gunnery course he will put to use during the Battle of Yuldong. So he commanded the field artillery. Battalion of the 10th B City. Oh. The vice, vice commander is then Captain Mariano Robles. So he, he took command of our artillery forces during the five battalion uh, Yuldong battle. So it was a naval gunner who was commanding the artillery batteries of the 10th B City. Yes, time. yes, that's, that's correct. It was a naval officer who was commanding that uh, particular FA unit of the 10th B City. So apart from that, after their arrival in um, Pusan and Miriam, so we, uh, if you remember, we were promised to receive tanks. So earlier yes. we deployed 16 yes. tanks, and then they, they promised that they will provide tanks. So it was Commander Liwana who, who seek out the Chaffee tanks, the famous Chaffee tanks that the tent had. So it was him who, who got it from an American depot and the heavy weapons, which uh, reconstituted the... Um, what do you call it? the tank company of Captain Yap? They, they, that time they call it the tankless company. So by the time uh, Commander Liwana got the weapons, uh, the tenth hierarchy decided that the Chaffee tanks, the seven actually seven Chaffee tanks, would go to the recon company and the heavy weapons to the tank company, being a special weapons company. So that, right. that's one of the legacies of Commander Liwana. The um this is out of curiosity in the Philippines they were not on the Chaffee right they were on the Sherman mm. in the Philippines yes when they were yes, still in the Philippines so they they transitioned to the Chaffee in Korea yes correct they're uh, already in Korea when they transitioned to the Chaffee to the Chaffee okay so, okay apart from that after his stint with the 10th BCT Commander Liwana became the uh, deputy commander of the Philippine Liaison Group United Nations Command in Tokyo. So the, the his commanding officer is a future fight then, Commander uh, Santiago Lapan. So they, they assisted the Filipino troops while in Japan or in transit troops. So basically that's that's Commodore Nubal. He became fight around 61. Oh, we, we, we actually met Nubal. Nubal. Yeah, mm. we did, right? Uh, um, also OSP guy, right? He was an o OSP uh, veteran also, right? Yes, yeah, correct, correct. So that, that's that, that's Nubal. So meeting one of our uh, POWs in Tachikawa. So mm -hmm. that's one of the functions of the PLG. So coordination with the other uh, UN forces. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Nubal and uh, Liwanag were the ones handling those particular uh, aspects of our uh, 
multinational cooperation. Okay. Yep. I think uh, we could just slide back up. So a little bit. But she's six and sixty-two. Okay. There you go. Oh, okay. okay. Did well, you jump one slide? Did you jump one slide? Okay, okay there. Yeah, okay. There you go. Sorry, okay. there. Okay. So you could see there that's RPS Bulacan and RPS Albay. So these are the two, the, the skippers, Lieutenant uh, Ordonez and Lieutenant Tandi Cosenti. So our first Muslim naval officer. So basically, I, I, I put the uh, caption here as wartime. So this is wartime. They conducted upon approaching the seas of uh, Pustan. So mm -hmm. they conducted anti-surface, anti-sub, and anti-air warfare. So this was with the uh, Americans and the British Navy. So basically, if you would, uh, it's not just shown. There's a submarine at the side of the LST, so an American sub. Okay. In the side of the LST. Yes, yes, yeah. Okay. At, at the other side. At the other what, side. what were the what what were their project? What were the threats? Of course, one could say that this was a. They, there would there would was there a threat that actually would justify these types of exercises, or were they standard exercises uh, just to? Um, hone the skills to to make to preserve skills, or was there really a a threat, a, a perceived threat that they believed? Of course, we all know that there was really no naval battle in the Korean War. But at that time, because they didn't have the benefit of hindsight, did they actually believe there was a threat? Okay, so basically, this was to hone our uh, skills, of course. Okay, the, there. This, this particular aspect. But when, so way back a few years, 1952, so uh, uh, this is already not part of the Korean War, but rather uh, one of our PCEs encountered a submarine of Lamont okay. Bay. So that's the first yes, ASW yes. mission. Yes, yes. And uh, of course, at that, um, so just to inform you all that the Chinese submarine forces started in 49, 48, and 49. So that's that's uh, one particular aspect that uh, that the allies, I think, uh, conducted this type of exercise. And I think I would believe that uh, during that situation, it's better to be safe than sorry. Yes. Yes, at least you're, you're prepared. So I think uh, being prepared is, is more important uh, encountering submarines at that time. Yes. So it shows, clear, it shows clear the logistics. So it was in, uh, one of the proofs that uh, our ships were there. So bringing down the supplies. And then Lieutenant Ordonez conducting the uh, talk for the troop. Uh, 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 this are the 14th. This is our 14th BCP troops. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. already, so this would be the year. Uh, uh, the year. Uh, the year. Oh, Fort Sorry. Contingent. Yeah, fourth contingent of defense. Yeah, fourth contingent. Uh, much, yeah, much later. Much later. Much later. Much later. Much later. Nineteen fifty-three. Yes. 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 Then. Then this one would be okay. So. Anti-surface. So, what was anti-surface? Because anti is sub warfare, we, we know. But this is uh, anti-surface. What what uh, what uh, type of um, of uh, weapons would they use in their anti-surface uh, role at that time? Basically, the, gunnery. Yes. Yes. Yeah, or torpedoes. Forty millimeter. Forty millimeter. Were there no torpedoes available? Uh, for the PCEs, we have way back, and of course our submarine chasers. But for the LSTs, so yes. I think, um, yeah, the, just just the, the gunnery for the LSTs on on this gunnery, particular. Gunnery, okay. Because mm -hmm. I remember because in uh, the AFP museum right now, there's an there's a torpedo, right? And even um, there's a torpedo being displayed. So um, for a long, long time, we didn't have torpedoes, but. Uh, we had torpedoes in the 1950s to the 1960s, I think, yes. and then yes. we sort of lost it in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and then right now I think we're beginning to reacquire it. Uh, of course, uh, these yeah. are very modern uh, uh, torpedoes that we're um, aspiring, or have we bought it already? 
Uh, yes, I think we, we already have it. Uh, if you yes. have uh, seen the page, uh, the defense pages yes. way back a few days yes, ago. Yes, yes. Yeah, we already have the labor sense. Okay, yes. Um, sorry, again, I interrupted. I just wanted to. Um, no, but before anything, um, let, let me just. Uh, there's a question here from uh, Randy, and um, he's asking if uh, were there weren't there any army officers trained as FO that they had to send uh, LTDR or Lieutenant Commander Liwanag? I think there were FOs uh, when the second, uh, with the 20th, it began with the 20th, because uh, I remember speaking to one veteran that uh, army officers with FO specialties were airlifted to Korea. Mm -hmm. So at that time, uh, it was around 52, 51 oh. to 52. Okay, and then um, we're suddenly so close up. Anyway, and then we have, uh, <laughs> I got scared of my own face. Eh? So, uh, and then we have uh, Kiefer, Kiefer Sutherland. On the mention of tanks, I remember visiting the relic site at PMA. Grabe, relic site. It's a static display naman. Huwag naman relic site. Parang naman, parang naman, meron na naman, meron na naman, ano to eh, some sort of, ano to, yung the relic. You know, may monster na biglang lalabas dyan kasi relic siya, eh, di ba? So the relic site at PMA. Since then, I always thought of building a scale model of a Sherman that belonged to the PEF talk. Were there any Shermans in PEF talk? Did, did we, uh, did, or was it always the, ch the Chaffee? Uh, from, we begin with the tent, so they have the Chaffee, and then I think the remaining Chaffees were transferred over to the 20th. Yes. Uh, start with the, uh, starting with the 19th BCC, they have their uh, composite whole uh, M4A1 Shermans. And then the 14th. So, yeah, uh, the 19th and the 14th has the Shermans. Mm. Okay. Thank you very much for that. So, okay, good. now we continue, if you don't mind, we can continue again with your uh, uh, presentation. Okay. Okay, for, for, I think for the next slide. Okay. Okay, uh, we discussed that. So uh, it's almost. Uh, okay, so yeah. there you go. Oh, was that the next slide? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's the last. That's the last. That's the last. Okay, so the last slide. So these were your sources. So the Philippine Navy by Commodore, you know, Giagona. Uh, yes, the book. This uh, the, the, the the sad yeah, thing yeah. about this is the fact that. The sad thing about this is the fact that all of these, many of these, majority of these books are all out of print. Of Philippine, the Filipiniana books, right? Uh, their majority are all out, or very difficult to source. Yes. But there's the, the, the yeah. newest, the newest is a hero, the history of the Philippine and the Korean War by Center for International Maritime Security. Are oh, you? It's you. There. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's you. Yeah. Ooh, so that, that's wow. uh, one of the first uh, articles I wrote for the yes. uh, Simpson, then covering, of course, the Korean War. So it's very okay. uh, unknown for, for the Navy. So, so let's say, so, so yes, read on. Were you going to say something? Uh, I, I remember this uh, Philippine Navy history book, a uh, slim volume uh, that was published around 1972. Uh, but there, the, I just saw it in the uh, Puff Museum uh, Library. I have a copy of uh, of uh, the <coughs> newer, the Philippine Navy, 1898 to 1998. But uh, I think in terms of the quality of the content, that older source has more information. I guess uh, because it was written uh, uh, with much of the archival material still uh, existing. I see. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, it's correct, correct. Uh, the, the, I, I, I think you're mentioning about the Philippine Navy and the New Society that was around 1972. Yes. 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 Mm. So there, there's a pop book there. I also saw that. In fact, it has the original cover. Yeah, but but the first Navy book that we had was uh, written by Commander Fernan, uh, Fer Fernando Edralin. So he was a cousin of President Marcos, and that's uh, it's mm -hmm. titled the Filipino Navy. So that was. Uh, 70 or 71 like that so it's the that, first that might be it it's a slim volume it's a slim uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. volume uh, uh, yes 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 it was followed by the uh philippine navy in the new society and then after that the uh, 
the uh, the one with the cover is the Peacock. So around the 90s already. It was followed around the 90s already. And then Commodore Gagonia published this during the time of uh, Foyk Admiral Santos. Mm -hmm. So yeah, those, those basically are the books that we have come for, for the Navy. But uh, mm -hmm. this was added, uh, I think a new released one, but still not yet available in commercially. So we covered it around 2015. I think we, we published it around 2015. So, so um, we had here when when people talk about the Philippine Expeditionary Forces to Korea, we only think of the army, the army yes. units, like the the tenth BCT being the most famous of all. And then we talk about the uh, the battles of Yultong, the battle of uh, and other battles that were of um, of Erie Hill, for example, of the other other uh, battalion combat teams but there is practically except for uh, your your article and those that appear in maybe this uh, books that uh, are even rare and difficult to find you don't see in popular uh, media the the issue of uh, philippine navy participation in the korean war and that being said it should also affect it, 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 in the numbers that of Filipinos who served in that war, because when you think of the uh, Philippine, the numbers of Filipinos who served in that war, we only look at the army veterans or those who were members. So there is because, for example, if you're talking about an LST, the complement of an LST is how many? How many? What is the crew of a typical LST? Yeah, Basically. I think around 100. So, on a so roughly 10 officers to about 60 to 80 uh, enlisted yeah. personnel. And that is already a sizable, and remember, even if you're talking about, and, and there were like two LSTs, right, being uh, sent. Yes, two to three. In fact, two to three. Two to three. So, three. so if it's 100, you're talking about the Navy would be, would be deploying 300 of its personnel at any given moment to the, uh, to support the, uh, operations of the our ground forces in the uh, Korean War. Am, am I correct to say that? And yes. that is a invisible contribution. And and yeah again because we, we know the we, we are aware of the trend of the um, outcome of the war at that time. But if if you if you look at uh, if if you are living in that period, if you are a serviceman during that period you'd still be, you know, uh, wary of the dangers that would, that you could um, face in, even in deployment in, um, in a naval vessel. Like, for example, you would not know if the Korean or Korean or Chinese forces would uh, suddenly go suicidal. Because if I do remember, there were accounts of, of um, Koreans or even Chinese uh, doing suicidal acts in that, uh, in the Korean War, and uh, what was that uh, ma that uh, um, prison riot at uh, Jeju? Uh, at Jeju, Jeju do. So, there was, so, yeah. so you could see here that that they were bound to commit acts of desperation. So mm -hmm. even if you're in a ship, and uh, and um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you were safe from a possible attack. So, so, so these people were still in the line of fire, you know. If you're a transport, you're practically on the coastline That's because you, you go you go close. You're now susceptible to air attack. You know yeah. things like that. That's so why that would also yes, Phil. So this brings me to my question: <clears throat> uh, Did the Navy issue uh, service ribbon uh, or something? Service ribbons to those uh, sailors and naval officers. That went to Korea. Uh, yes, uh, to the uh, I have records of the officers receiving it. So the UN Service Medal and the Korean Campaign Medal. So those but were, the were of the LST. But but these were US. Uh, were this were this UN awards or were this local Filipino Philippine uh, decorations? I think UN or yeah UN UN UN, UN. And, uh, Korean. And then, of course, our gold cross. So gold uh, cross. Our, ours, ours. Tribute, yeah, ours. And then some VSM, I think VSMs or MF, uh, triple M like that. So, so sort of those. Uh, 
Kasi if, uh, if, if one we have records of the officers only. Kasi we were saying a while only ago, like for example. Only the records of the officers. Yeah? Not, well, only the records of the officers, none of the sailors. Yes, uh, I we I have gotten some of the officers' records. Uh, that's one of the problems that we had way back. Uh, but, records keeping. Because it's possible, man. Because that. Oh yeah, because exactly possible. Because if you look at it, uh, the problem, for example, in the armed forces of the Philippines is this horrible habit of destroying records. If it's not done intentionally, it's done by. Um, as we call in Tagalog, kapababayan, di ba? So, like, they just rot or they're inanay sila. And, uh, or sometimes you have a certain incident when a co-plotter decides to burn down a GHQ, you know, and that wing that burns down, there goes all the files also. So, little things like that, you know, then tend to happen, okay? So, so yes, a lot of uh, records do get lost, Um uh, in our case and the problem with us is that uh, we are not like the americans or other nationalities or the british or the germans who love to write their memoirs so we we are fortunate in fact to have a very few um veterans who do write their memoirs but generally none so so we are always faced with the fact that as researchers and historians we're running after time like um our ages, for example, okay, papanggap na ako na kunyari bata ako, no? So, in our ages, no? Um, when we were students, these veterans were already in their um, 60s when we were students. So, they were getting old already. So they were in our 60s. Kasi 1980, <laughs> 1980s tayo. Unlike kasi Mark. Mark siguro 99, batang 90s yan, eh. 80s, actually. 70s. Tanda mo talaga. Anyway, so, <laughs> so, so that being said, <laughs> so, so that being said, yung bang, yung hahabol ka na kasi nag-tail end na yung mga, ano to, yung mga veterans. So, ang daming work na gagawin. No? But anyway, going back, so, um, so, uh, if you look at the numbers of the armed forces of the Philippines in the year 1950, okay, the total contribution of the Navy in any of these operations would be practical, I think, like 50% of the Navy already uh, in terms of uh, capabilities, in terms of, uh, uh, and a certain, and a large percentage in terms of manpower. Because, uh, ilan ba tayo nun? Um, you, you, you showed the photographs of our capital ships, right? And um, you said that there were only five at that time. How many were there at that time uh, of our, uh, ships at that time mark is mark frozen if you uh, around 50 so i think the navy has only there. roughly no no five okay. lsts way back the i think my yes. power for the navy around that time was 3500 so, okay so 10 percent yeah, of I, the I, navy I, would be deployed right yes correct correct yeah 10 percent so so you imagine well, well, that's the thing. Eh? When you look at the capabilities of the country at the time, you, you, the um, the army numbered at the time. What was how? What was the strength of the army at that time? Um, we had around ten thousand plus, thereabouts, fifteen, thereabouts. No, around uh, twenty plus. Although it gained 20, expanded 20. in, uh, it gained yeah. expanded to forty five thousand by nineteen fifty one. Yeah, but in nineteen fifty. At the outbreak of the Korean War, we were at 20 plus, okay, 20 right? 20 plus, yes. And then plus. we sent the best unit abroad. Mm -hmm. 1,000 were sent abroad. At that same time, there was an insurgent, there was a rebellion of the hooks, still in full. And at the same time, we sent 1,000. Then we also sent, uh, we also deploy additional 300 uh, naval personnel. Were there any Air Force sent also to Korea? Or was it just? Uh, were there, uh, yes, was yes. There a, but there is yes. uh, there is a an air force contingent, of course. Um, uh, actually, it's the first uh, joint AAP uh, operation. Korea was the okay. first AAP joint operation. Uh, starting from the tenth, there are already um, air force personnel attached. We we have an uh, what we, uh, air to ground liaison team, so we have that. It's a three man team, and then 
We have uh, liaison pilots assigned with the U.S. squadrons, uh, General Labadia, General Ebuen. So a lot of those uh, officers were in the war earlier. Then the uh, yeah up up to the second but a uh, second BCP uh, the pop was represented. So that's it. That, that, that's why a joint first joint AAP operation. But but it wasn't a combat. Um contingent basically sent by the air unlike i think the first it would be uh, it would not be composed of um, let's say our fighter pilots our uh no no uh although those deployed were uh, fighter qualified uh captain fighter Rui, qualified the, yes. yeah yeah they are uh, mustang mostly uh, most mustang pilots mm. at, at that time and but then, and, and, um, yeah uh, okay uh the 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 air uh, uh, I earlier mentioned the air to ground liaison team so they they're involved yes. in combat yeah okay uh, for uh, yes. modern day forward air controllers and one was captured one was captured by the uh, Chinese oh really oh who oh, what happened to him what happened was there any did he survive uh, yes he survived uh, he survived uh, Staff Sergeant okay. Jimenez so he was a communication specialist. Uh, he's part of the uh, three-man air to ground team under Lieutenant Carreñas and Technical Sergeant Tonalba. So he was captured around uh, Pyongyang. So he joined uh, a patrol and then during uh, an ambush, he was uh, one of the captured Filipinos at that stage. So he's strong one, that means he was, he was with the tent? Yes, he was with the tent. He was with the tent. Basically. He was with the tent. Because the, the tent has the distinction of being of crossing the line from... Uh, Pusan to the Yalo and back. Correct, correct, correct. It right. was the only Philippine unit to do that. <laughs> this was during the withdrawal, no, Mark, when he was captured? Yeah, 51, uh, yeah, 51. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, April, April or July? Uh, yeah, July, I think, July 51. <laughs> What what other so so you 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 had then then in the navy was anybody captured in the navy? Ah uh, none none basically none, none was captured. But, uh, oh, oh, especially Commander Liwan, I guess five. Right? Then yes. we we don't have records if any other naval yeah. officers were brought in. So uh, it's just Commander Liwan who was on the ground at that time. Okay, and then uh, there were no uh, casualties among the navy personnel. Any incident? Yeah. Any casualties? Uh, none, none that we have, or mm -hmm. none on the records that uh, we've seen. Okay, Mark, I'm, I'm just interested, uh, Mark, uh, because uh, after Incheon, there were two major naval operations that were conducted by the UN forces. One was the landing in Wonsan in uh, October 1950, oh. and later was a naval evacuation of uh, uh, at Hungnam. Uh, I think that was. Uh, early 1951 or late or December 1950 did our ships participated in those two operations uh, none. None, none at that time but uh, uh Hongnam was number 1950 but I believe there is a Filipino squad at, uh, at Hangnam so to assist oh. the civilians the five five uh, headed by a master sergeant I just forget the name so they were the five Filipinos who were uh, tasking Hangnam to assist the uh, refugees oh. Uh, okay. and these were these are naval personnel or or army uh, army army these are army personnel that were okay. uh, so they were left behind to assist the uh, evacuation in hangnam so most of the lsc involved were us so yeah. that's the filipino uh, participation in the hangnam evacuation mm. is there anything written on that is there like a, a manuscript yes. on that or are you going to write something about that it's, it's pretty hard. Uh, hopefully, hopefully, I could, like, I could uh, uh, basically not left behind, but I uh, was tasked to assist the UN forces at that uh, particular mm -hmm. uh, evacuation mission. Mm -hmm. uh, because, because, uh, I think they're also evacuating okay, civilians. Italian, yeah. Left behind. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but then it's a catchy title. Yes. The so, another, uh, uh, yes, 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 Phil. I'm just curious since uh, you were you you the creator of the Pest Korean War, uh, Memorial Hall. Uh, yes, yes. This is, uh, and this is one of the things that have been really 
I'll, I'll digress a bit about uh, the Navy, but uh, focusing on the 10th yeah. BCT yeah. and the Battle of Yultong, I'm really, really tired of reading that the 10th BCT faced an entire army group the, of the Koreans and survived. Uh, it, I mean, it's, well, I, it's, it's an exaggeration. I think Reno can I think Reno can answer that because Reno came up with a yes. with a chart about uh, or a um, or some yes, yes. he has his presentation there and uh, uh, you can share actually, I think Reno I think you can share yeah, yes, actually so. uh, actually uh, the uh, 10th BCT did not face a uh, a whole yes. army group or even yes. an uh, army size unit uh, it faced a uh, single division, although that single division greatly outnumbered the 10th BCT. It's the 34th uh, division of the Chinese People's uh, Volunteer uh, Army. Okay. Um, I, I uh, what, uh, actually uh, one of our earlier one of the one who followed our podcast uh, asked me if I could also show. Uh, let's say, organizational charts or orders of battle. Uh, I think I gave uh, something to John Ray with regard to the uh, organizational chart of the battalion combat teams because that's uh, fairly uh, standard. But a battalion combat team numbered uh, around uh, 1,000. Uh, it has, uh, it's more powerful than a, uh, a standard battalion because of the attachment. Actually, in the case of the uh, 10th BCT, it has an attached uh, uh, artillery battery and an attached uh, tank company. Aside from its, uh, aside from the three infantry uh, companies and uh, heavy weapons uh, company, so that's uh, yes. It's a reinforced unit. Uh, that's why uh, they call the combat uh, team. Okay. Uh, although uh, prior to the Battle of uh, Yultong, the uh, uh, the tent, uh, or here it is, uh, Okay, so uh, three rifle companies, a weapons company, a reconnaissance company that can also double as a uh, uh, as a uh, as an infantry company too. Mm -hmm. Service then. A field artillery uh, battle, but in the in uh, in the case of the tent, it's a field artillery battery and a tank company. So mm -hmm. all in all, uh, nominally, uh, a battalion combat team uh, will number a thousand, uh, one thousand. Uh, well, uh, oh, at least drops. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh. Compare it now with the current uh, Philippine Army battalion, oh, the nominal oh, strength oh. would be five hundred. Yeah. Or like um, that that's another. I, I would really commend the you know, the uh, CGI effect of this particular graphic that we're seeing right now. Yes, uh, very uh, very uh, high tech. I had a high time, Joe, high tech. Uh, you know? Yeah, right. Oh. Excellent. Uh, this is yeah, excellent. Okay. Just to add, just to add, I don't know. Uh, the <laughs> so the tent. I think the all the five BCTs number around the the tent is around one thousand three hundred three. So mm -hmm. this is the second. It's around one thousand six hundred. So one thousand four hundred for the twentieth. I think. Um, I think um, most didn't know that the BCTs that deployed are are known as either uh, AFP units, not as army units. So it has, of course, uh, what Rino has said. Uh, it has an attached uh, FA battalion. It has the naval and air elements. So it's an AFP unit. The, the organizational structure is much different from the uh, BCTs. That were left behind here during yes, the war. One in, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, now, uh, now. Uh, so, how about the opponent, the thirty-fourth uh, division? Again, uh, to be clear, it's one division. Although that one division still greatly outnumbered the uh, the tenth battalion, battalion combat team. The, the uh, uh, yeah. The just, uh, just, if I can add, if I can add, if I can just add something, you know, if you don't mind, uh, the um the one 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 should not think of the battalion combat team all 1000 facing the enemy uh, a, a great percentage is strung out right in fact the ones who faced the brunt of the chinese offensive were barely how many 
think uh, company uh, size units. Yeah, so the company size, well, say, several hundred, uh, yes, yes, several yes. hundred, were facing uh, human waves of thousands in in uh, um, uh, of of uh, a division that numbered six thousand, right? Which uh, 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 although was badly degraded, because I think a Chinese division was ten thousand, but even though it's badly degraded. The, the ratio is still very much in favor of the Chinese. Okay, yeah, going back again to you, really sorry about that. At that time, too, the 10th BCT numbered 900. So they're also, yes, as well as the 1,300, that's a significant uh, reduction of uh, forces. Yes. Now, so, uh, so basically, you have here a Chinese division of around 6,000 uh, men facing the uh, 10th Battalion Combat Team. And again, to reinforce uh, what Jose said, at the main point of contact, that's where the combat happened, the odds are even uh, greater. Higher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, are even, uh, are, are even uh, the, the odds faced by the Filipinos. Uh, perhaps the one advantage they have is that they're, they're in uh, a defensive uh, position. <laughs> they're also mm -hmm. well supported by uh, heavy weapons and they have armor. Uh, However, uh, that uh, what, while those are we, we can say force multipliers for the Filipinos, uh, what cannot be denied is that they were they were greatly uh, outnumbered by the uh, Chinese uh, in that uh, battle. Okay, you have to understand then too that uh, the Filipinos were not the only ones in that sector. Uh, they had uh, elements of the Turkish unit, elements of a U.S. Army National Guard unit, uh, and in to the front uh, was also a British elements of a British battalion. So they were not alone in facing the Chinese attack. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, I think that's about it. Uh, Turkish were on the right or the left, and then the Puerto Rican, 65th Infantry. Yes. Uh, battalion of the Gloucestershire were on the left too, so and the U.S. Army unit. But basically, the tent was cut off from the other, other UN uh, units when uh, from when Seoul said that uh, all uh, UN units has to fall back. So that particular message wasn't received by the tent. So it was decided by uh, Colonel Ojeda to hold ground at Yuldong. So, but of course, there are other allies, especially artillery that supported the uh, pep, uh the tent, the tent. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, when all the other all the rest of the units were forced to retreat, uh, the British and the Filipino unit remained in their largely remained. And correct me if I'm wrong, because when I'm reading things, uh, it came yep. down. Just uh, a little bit. Just a bit it came down to a, a I think, yeah. please correct me if I'm wrong, I think it came down to a choice by the attacking Chinese units. Who will they take out first, the British or the Filipino? If I always believe that take if, out where? if they just turned and went for the Filipinos first, it was the British unit would have survived and the Filipinos would have been wiped out. Yun ang tingin ko from my, all my readings. Is that... Uh, plausible or uh, valid observation? Uh, uh, the, the, there was one precedent uh, with regards to that particular, I think, before Yildong, uh, it was a standard, uh, the tent decided that uh, information from the U.S., uh, from the unit of General Robert Sol, he sent a message to Colonel Ojeda that the uh, <coughs> Chinese are on their way to the Filipino positions. So mm -hmm. the Filipinos prepared, decided to take a stand, but it turned out that the um, Chinese selected the rock, a uh, particular rock army unit. And instead of engaging the Filipinos, they decided to engage the rock army unit or even oh, uh, the US army unit. I see. So not divert. And also another part of the Battle of Yultong, but not necessarily about the Filipinos, I read somewhere. I was I know, actually I was told that uh, the, in the Chinese attack, they used um, radio misinformation 
uh, they sent uh, false information to the U.S. batteries, to the field artillery batteries, to fire on the Turkish unit instead of the Chinese unit. So in a, when the artillery uh, fire hit the Turkish brigade uh, and the Chinese attacks afterward, uh, the Turkish brigade, it was a brigade, uh, was softened up for the Chinese attack. Uh, okay. Uh, what, what, what I uh, read is was that the Turkish artillery was captured by the Chinese and it was sent, uh, it was used against them. So that, oh, that's see. what I read. So it was, yeah, it was, it was uh, not America, it was their own artillery. Their own artillery was used against them. So I that's see. that's one of the things that I, I I've read way back. So e even the Chinese has penetrated the uh, Turkish reserve uh, section at the at the rear. So that's that's how far the Chinese were uh, able to penetrate the uh, Turkish forces. Oh, and and uh, one there was a, a brigade size about three battalions. I think I think it's a battalion. It's a battalion of the Turks oh, okay. that was. Uh, that's uh, that's yeah. an element of that brigade. Okay. Yes. Thank you. And that's okay. that, and by by showing how the Chinese were able to infiltrate infiltrate the Turkish, it showed it can, we can see how the defensive how the Chinese failed because they used essentially the same tactics against all those units. Uh, massive human wave infiltrate go to the rear and attack but the other units were able to uh, uh gave way but the, the but the philippine unit did not they were able to hold but it was the correct me if i'm wrong it was the actions of the tank company that actually stopped the, infilt the initial infiltration uh, yes, that's basically it was the tank company. Uh, it was the tank uh, personnel of the tank company. Uh, I, uh, Captain Captain Yap was uh, yes. told not to pursue the, but he continued. So yeah, I think that's what one written in the book. Oh, and that's why he earned the uh, medal of valor because uh, with the if the if the tank company had faltered. There would not have been maybe uh, only a remnants of the 10th BCT would have uh, survived. So and, uh, yes, that, that, that would definitely happen if it they didn't the so the some portions of the uh, tank company were divided into particular sectors. So no, that, that, I think that's one of the good uh, tactics that that we we used at that time. So Jian here, uh, Jian Sedino has a question again and total how many chaffis were eventually assigned you said seven right yes uh, seven chaffis seven chaffis so it's a total of seven chaffis and only mm -hmm. chaffis i remember did i hear right a while ago you mentioned the hellcat i mean the armored yeah, hellcat uh, right not the not the aircraft hellcat but the the, yes, the, the, the m18 uh, yes yes uh no no that's uh basically the m18 was from our army stack and then yes the in Sherman's were from the uh, 10th BCT. Those were the tanks that we deployed around July, July 1950. So before our troops arrived in, in so, Korea. So, so that the, the armor went first? Yeah, the armor went first and were utilized with the Allied or the uh, US Army. So, so, so in other words, we, we have... So, I mean, this is just again, again, uh, I'm going to go geek again here. Let's go oh. and geek on these things because, because whenever we think of uh, Sherman's in the Korean War, we're, we always envision the EC-8s, right? But I, I don't think we had EC-8s uh, in the Philippine Army. These were the Correct. regular VVS, uh, <clears throat> was it VVS, uh, the volunt uh, uh, what's it? Volut Vertical, Vertical Volute Spring Vertical Suspension. Vertical Volute Spring Suspension, the VVSS. So, so the VVSS Shermans was what we brought there with the shorter 75s, right? The standard yes. 75, not the, so, so, Again, for you mod scale modelers out there, you can actually do a 75 millimeter Sherman, which is most likely composite hull. Mm -hmm. yeah. Although there yeah, was M4A1, so that's what we deployed. That's what we deployed. we were M4A1. M4A1. So either um, cast or composite hull uh, Shermans 
of the Philippine Army, 75 millimeter gun standard, not the long barreled one, uh, not the 76, right? 76 was the uh, one used uh, by the EC8s, right? Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So I don't think I don't think we even have uh, the 76 uh, VVS Shermans. No, we didn't have. We were, we had the um, really limited feel, to 75 millimeter I, guns. Because I, the, the Americans did not use the long barreled uh, tanks here in the in the. Mm. They were though they really were shipped, they were shipped to Okinawa, in mm. in the war. That's why you had during the Second World War. But but in the first and the but during the Second World War in the Philippines, our stocks really came from from surplus American equipment that were earmarked for deployment in the Philippines at that time. So. So we didn't, I don't think we had the EC8. So, but it's really interesting now uh, in terms of, of, of uh, because I, I have this book, I, I don't know, I think it's by Zaloga on uh, Korea, uh, US uh, or Allied Armor in Korea. And there's yeah. no mention of a Sherman with the, uh, of the uh, VVSS Sherman. So that's something that's new. Yeah, uh, we, we have a different Sherman with the 14th BCT. I think uh, not exactly an EC8, but a different model and not a composite hull. So it's a different ah. Sherman that the 14th BCT had at that time in Korea. So but, 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 they, have, they have choppies and they have a another type of model of uh, EC8. Uh, yeah, yeah, larger yeah, than yeah. There's a picture of that actually, right? There's yeah, a picture I, of that. Uh, oh. it, yeah. Yeah. Um, by any chance, do you have it right now with you? Ah, uh, not I, okay. <laughs> I, 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 yeah. uh, looking at uh, looking at the way he look at the way he looked at this desk. I would assume his desk is so cluttered. <laughs> so that, <laughs> <laughs> I, I had to be locked up with me right now. Here. <laughs> so yes, yes, Phil, you were going to say something. Uh, one of the things here: uh, the chappies were transferred from one uh, BCT to the next. Wow, when the, they were, okay. And how many, there were seven Chappies, how many Shermans were there? Uh, okay, so we, we don't have any records of that, but roughly I have uh, a photo of about six to seven Shermans and six to seven Chappies. So roughly uh, seven tanks there with were, uh, a squadron, they, they call it a squadron in the army. So seven, seven tanks of... Uh, uh, Chaffees and seven of the uh, Shermans. So it's like, uh, they, co they, they, they coexisted at, the same, at a certain point, they coexisted at the same time. Yes, yeah, uh, especially with the 14th uh, BCT. They coexisted with the, uh, they, they already have the Wrangler jeeps with them when, 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 they, when they were in Korea. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, no, no, uh, uh, just to add, the, the the, just the last one, the, um, the 16 tanks that we deployed, those were the tanks that went into UST in 1944. They're the ones who uh, are the same the first tanks. Yeah, the same tanks. The same yeah, tanks battling the first uh, the, We have uh, the tanks name. Actually, we have uh, found that one that was lost in North Korea. It's the Impatient Virgin. Yeah, one of the tanks that entered the UST rounds. All the way to end, end up in UST. So, um, out of curiosity, yung Sherman na nandun, that's in the PMA heritage site, uh, are one of the tanks from UST? Ah, uh, no, no, it's it's different. It's not. It's not. No, no, those oh, are, those would be. Uh, it was, uh... oh. Okay. Uh, there were, know, I, there were know, many uh, times, but. There were many tank battalions you see, that were equipped also with the uh, composite hull Sherman mm. in uh, uh, operating in the uh, Philippines. Okay. I'll just go back to Reno because he was supposed to show the order of battle of the uh, uh, Chinese. Chinese. Uh, Chinese. Uh, Chinese People's Liberation Army Division. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, un unfortunately, uh, I tried hard during the intervening hours before to find an organizational chart uh, because that was really the request of one of the ones who watched our earlier podcast. Uh, the only thing uh, actually even asked Jose were text uh, descriptions of uh, how large is a Chinese uh, division. Uh, that, a Chinese uh, division would be... In, uh, Korea. Yeah. 
It will well, be made up of three. No, three, yeah. uh, three regiments. They, well, they actually follow a standard. Uh, three, uh, uh, it's a triangular division. A, uh, a, a, a divi uh, division is broken down into three regiments. Regiment. And each regiment has... Uh, Three uh, infantry, uh, uh, three infantry uh, battalions also. Uh, although this, we have to, we have to. Let's not forget that this is the Chinese uh, divisions are light infantry divisions. So they're similar to the so the, use of, uh, the Philippine army so, divisions. So they're basically uh, most of their personnel are infantry, uh, yeah. li li light uh, infantry. So numbered nine thousand. Uh, nine to ten thousand. That's the uh, that's the nominal uh, nominal strength. Time, time check just, just to just to interrupt. Time check. We're uh, on our last uh, few minutes of the okay, uh, yes. podcast. Okay. 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 Uh, since we're discussing Chinese uh, division, uh, I've read somewhere that they are based on the Soviet model. So if that's the case, again, yes. correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, so if it's the Soviet model. Uh, is being followed, only two of the regiments will be actually attacking and the third regiment would just go toward uh, to whoever which regiment succeeds. That's uh, that's how the Soviet system is supposed to work. So okay. was that the, way, the same thing that the Chinese did? Uh, no, no. Their, their, uh, their tactics were basically much, much influenced by uh, the uh, Chinese Civil War. Okay. So uh, that's, why, that's, why, uh, be, uh, that's why basically, unlike the Soviets, because you have to remember, the Soviets uh, became a conventional, uh, conventional heavy armored uh, army. While their divisions might number the same as a Chinese uh, division, uh, the uh, tactic, techniques, and procedures, or the operating uh, doctrine, was much different. So okay. here you have a largely light infantry army that lives on infiltration, okay. uh, and, and also uh, there were uh, also uh, much influenced by Mao's uh, guerrilla warfare uh, precepts. And uh, also remember that during the Chinese Civil War uh, from 1946 to 1949 they were facing largely conventional uh, nationalist forces. So that's why during the initial clashes with the uh, Americans, uh, they were able to surprise the United States and other uh, UN uh, forces. Uh, although by 1951, uh, many of the units that uh, have fought against them, whom they forced to withdraw from North Korea, also learned. And I believe the pep talk, uh, the 10th Battalion combat, combat Team was one of them because they adopted uh, a, a defensive strategy uh, which basically was a hedgehog. That's how uh, they did it. They did not mind that they're going to be uh, surrounded as long as they have uh, fire support as they can maintain their positions and hold on by day because usually the Chinese favor night attacks uh, to, to mitigate the effects of UN firepower. Uh, and especially they because, yeah. The concept of hedgehog defense is the is not entirely new uh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, in that uh, aspect because of the fact that um, the French did it in 1940, uh, the yeah. Germans did it in nine, in uh, 1944 uh, onwards as they were falling back to Germany. The concept of hedgehogs. Now, uh, if I if I just may, um, may um, read here some of the questions. Uh, Remaining questions um, of our um, guests is that um, Kiefer here again asks if the uh, Battle of Yultong was a pivotal moment in the Korean War. Was it? What, what was its strategic uh, effect? Was it really that, uh, or was it a localized um, event? Did it affect the larger battle? What's your assessment? Uh, What's your okay, thoughts? I'll, I'll answer. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think Yuldong was a pivotal battle because uh, it leads to the road to Seoul. So it was, in fact, some of the other persons that I talked, uh, if the tent hasn't stayed in Yuldong, so there would be no Seoul at that time. So I uh, think that the Philippines were the game changers. 
So mm -hmm. yeah, we, we lost the Brit uh, the British, the Turks. So if that particular radio message uh reached the Filipinos and they pulled out. So the, the road to Seoul was open. So that's one of the uh, written um, or analysis. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. So, Thank you for that. And then uh, yeah, um, uh, we have here Randy again. Randy is asking, um, was there any armor versus armor action involving PEF talk uh, armor in uh, against uh, the, the, because the Chinese and the, the Chinese were also operating um, law armored units uh, in uh, among the so-called uh, volunteer forces. The the uh, yes, yes, Mark. Uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, specifically not uh, exactly tank to tank, but rather uh, tank to artillery or tank again. Uh, my we uh, of the seven choppies that the tent got, we lost one. Mm -hmm. So we lost we lost that in Salmori. So for the loss of four crewmen. So up to now, it's still debatable that either it was hit by a Chinese artillery or a mine. So the Americans and the British forces uh, says that it was hit by a mine. Our troops told that it was hit by heavy artillery. Mm -hmm. So, but the other way around, since we've already discussed, uh, mentioned the Chinese armor, so they have the P-3485. So during the battle for Hill Eri, if I'm not mistaken, or battle for Nak Tedong, we, we knock out two of those. Mm. So not exactly, not exactly tank to tank action, but rather infantry and uh, artillery uh, um, engagements. But like a tank hunter, like a tank killing team, to be exact, right? So um, yes, uh, so we're in the home stretch already of our program. So we'll have a few minutes left, like two minutes left actually. So yes, um, let's have our final words basically. But before that, Mark, what's the status of the Korean uh, museum that you are uh, the curator of? Is it open? What What is its plans uh, in this pandemic that we have right now? Yes. Uh, actually, we're still waiting for the uh, from the go signal for the uh, uh, from the main office. Uh, as of now, we're still close to visitors. Uh, once it changes, uh, I guess I will uh, inform the public or. Would you do, course, do you have any uh, let's say any on, do you have anything online that uh, we could uh, is there like a Facebook page of your museum? Ah uh, yes, we we do have the Pef Talk Korean okay. War Memorial Hall. Uh, in fact, I uh, I uh, I upload daily uh, info bits about the Pef okay. Talk. So, okay. Yeah. So uh, the school children or even uh, enthusiasts could uh, uh, check on the Facebook page. Okay. So it's updated so, uh, for every uh, history articles. Ah, okay. Thank so you. guys, so guys, any final words before we uh, wrap up? Okay, so I'm turning the floor over to you guys. Uh, let's start first with uh, Phil. Well, uh, one thing that I have to add because uh, a lot of Filipinos today, uh, especially the young ones, think that the pep talk fought on its own, but it actually was attached with a U.S. division. It was, I think, the U.S. Uh, 25th. Was it the 25th? A, a number of divisions were uh, 40, attached 40, to it. 40, 40, 40th division. 40th, uh, 40th. Uh, Thunderbird, Thunderbird division. Well, okay, at at so, a certain point, I think it was also attached. Was it ever attached to the 1st so, Cavalry? It, at a certain point, one of the BCTs might be early, might be the early, early the, 50s, the early, the early deployments. The, the 10th, I the, think, the 10th. Oh, with, with the 1st Cavalry. Yeah. And another piece of trivia. During the Battle of Yultong, uh, operationally, the, the 10th Battalion Combat Team came under the command of the British for a short while and then reported back to U.S. Command. Oh, well, there's one thing that I forgot to ask a bit, but I would like to really ask. You know that, was there any code name for the Philippine Navy operations in PEF talk? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, none that I know of. I haven't seen any records. Hindi pa tayo mahilig nun kasi magbigay ng mga oplan oplan names at that time. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Yan ang hilig na, di ba? Kukuha ka na lang ng pastillas, may oplan na, eh, di ba? Parang ganun, no? So, <laughs> so, yeah, so okay, yes. Yeah. I, I yeah, just to add, you know, um, our tent was attached with the British briefly, uh, then with, of course, the U.S. Army, the 45th and uh, third, third division. Then we were attached with the Canadians. So there's a joint Filipino-Canadian tank group 
that went into North Korea. Parang gandang gawin ng dahirama yan, ano? Uh, I think oh, the, that, that Canadian tank group was equipped with EC, the fact it's the Princess Patricia Regiment or something. Correct. Yes, yes, correct. Princess Patricia under Major uh, Queen and First Lieutenant er, uh, Ergala of the 10th DCT. So Chappies wow. and uh, uh, Sherman Tanks, joint Canadian Filipino. Wow. So, yes, Rino. Uh, yes, you... actually, uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Mark Conde. No? He's... Uh, Actually, a uh, commander already in the Philippine uh, Coast Guard, Coast Guard. Auxiliary. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Mark. Uh, yes, hope, yes. Uh, a long time uh, commander already. Very long time yeah. commander. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, so, uh, because uh, basically you have uh, enlightened and educated uh, our audience with uh, one of the least discussed episodes. Uh, uh, in our own uh, military history. That is the role of the Philippine Navy uh, yeah. in the uh, Korean War. Uh, hopefully, uh, uh, future episodes will see you uh, discussing more, but not only the Korean War, but the role of the Navy in uh, in our own... Uh, even even the Coast Guard. Episodes, even the Coast Guard. Our That's military it. history, yes. Sure, sure. sure. Yeah, mm. I'd, I'd be glad to. Uh, okay, just to add, uh, just to add before mm. parting out, um, the PN's first mission was in Shanghai, 1949. And then Matsu and Moy. So we were involved on those. And, uh, uh, one, I, our uh, and I assume you're going to write about it. Ah, uh, okay. Hopefully I could find further yes, information. You, yes, yes, you will. Have the name of my <laughs> yes, maybe, you will. Maybe, Mark, a book should be for Kabin. Yeah. It, it can hopefully, be like an anthology of Philippine Navy, uh, of maritime, you did so. So, Mark, any la any uh, uh, parting words for our uh, guests here or our audience? Okay, yeah, thank you, thank you for listening. I guess, uh, glad to impart and of course, uh, spread out Philippine military history and uh, to discuss with our country's best military historians here. So, oh, thank you, know, and actually go, go yes. back uh, away, and then surveil. Yes. yes. Okay. Okay, so thank you very much. And before I before we sign out here, I'd like to read Captain Basa. Captain Basa is, is thanking us and he's saying thank you for this. It's a very informative show, and we're glad to have that type of yeah. of uh, feedback because that's what we intend really to do. In the midst of all the uh, garbage that's coming out in social media by many people, many posters and whatever, here we try to give you what is history, what is credible, what is um, what is um, scholarly uh, uh, done, okay? So here we are and um, uh, for you guys so that uh, you would learn a lot from uh, from this experiences that we are um, doing. So again, once again, I'd like to thank everybody. And uh, with that, um, I would also like to thank Mark Condenato for being such an engaging guest and very, very articulate, uh, very informative. I learned a lot from you, and I will henceforth buy all your books. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so one of these thank days we'll the visit the uh, the Korean War Museum, and uh, we will uh, have a tour of it. And at the same time, with um, I invite you over to the AFP Museum, and uh, yeah. I would. Um, tour you, you guys there, okay? So with that, thank you very thank much you. to everybody. Thanks thank to our you. audience. Thanks and uh, thank uh, Thanks. have a good night to everybody. Okay, thank you. Good night. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.